Hey church, I hope you're blessed and thank you for joining me tonight for our Wednesday night Bible study. We're going to pick up on our um, series on the doctrine of repentance and today we are going to talk about the hatred that we should have for sin. So if you want to open up your Bibles to uh, the book of Romans, uh, you can hold your place in Romans chapter 7 and also Uh, We'll be spending some time there in chapter 7 and then also in chapter 8. But I'll let you know whenever we get to that point. Um, Yeah, so like today, just I want to focus on on how we as God's people uh, should hate sin. And I want to talk to you about what that means and also what that looks like. Um, It was John Owen who said that we must be killing sin or it will be killing us. Uh, that's a famous quote uh, from him, and it, it shows you the seriousness that we ought to have uh, towards sin. And um, obviously what he said was biblical. In fact, the Bible says in Colossians 3, verse 5, tells us to put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Uh, the term earthly can translate to what is flesh, fleshly in you, uh, what is of the flesh. And then in Colossians 3, verse 5, it goes on to list some examples of these earthly things, sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry, the passage says. But I want to, I want, I want to point you to the beginning of that passage where it says to put these things to death. And uh, that is essentially what John Owen is saying in, in his quote, uh, we need to be killing sin or it will be killing us. So when we look at scripture, it is clear about what we ought to do. It is clear as Christians how we should treat sin. But the question that many people have is, how does it all work and how does it make sense in a practical way and that's what I hope to give to you today now this is I don't have all the answers uh, with this 20 to 30 minute Bible study but I hope uh, that the truth that that I do give you from God's Word will help you in the area of hating your sin now if we are going to put sin to death in our lives then the thing that we must do is we must make it our enemy. And that is, that's of utmost importance, that we make sin our enemy. And unless we do that, uh, sin will always be around. It will be our friend. And we will, not, we will not put any effort to ending it in our lives. So it must be our enemy. And in order to make it our enemy, then if you follow that logic, that train of thought, if we make it to be our enemy, then that means we hate sin and also we love God. So in order for sin to be our enemy, we must hate sin and we must love God. Uh, John 14, 15, uh, in John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That makes it really clear. There are people today who claim to love Jesus, but they live lives that are opposite of what Jesus obeys us to live. And Jesus makes it clear. If we truly love him, then we will follow his commandments. So the truth is, we disobey the Lord because we do not love him as we should. And I can say it, I can say it another way. When we disobey the Lord, we choose to love him, or we choose not to love him as we should. Um, conversely, when we disobey the Lord, because, or excuse me, conversely, we disobey the Lord because we don't hate sin as we should. So there are the two issues. When we disobey the Lord, we are doing that because we are not loving him as we should. When we disobey the Lord, we do that because we are not hating sin as we should. 
So where do we go from here? How do we get to the point that we obey God and disobey sin in a sense? Well, the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, why should we hate sin? Or actually, that's the first thing I'd like to bring up in, as far as the topic to talk about. Uh, why should we hate sin? Well, number one, we should hate sin because God has said for us to hate sin. Uh, this truth has come to us from God's word, and God says that sin is harmful to us, it destroys lives, and that the devil uh, uses sin uh, to build his kingdom and bring about his own purpose. But we know that God's purpose trumps the devil's purpose. But the fact is, is that we should hate sin because God says that we should hate sin. Romans 12, 9, it says, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Now, that's just one example, but the Bible is very clear for us in the stance that we should have against sin. And that's the number one reason. But even beyond that, there are other reasons of why we should hate sin. The other reason is because sin is a, is a deviation from God's law. It is a deviation from God's divinely, uh, divinely uh, inspired will, or excuse me, revealed will. Sin signifies that we miss the mark. God has said, I want you to do this. And instead of doing what God has said, we have decided in our hearts to do something differently. When we sin, we miss God's mark. God's mark is faithful and true. And when we veer off of that, we are no longer faithful and true. Uh, at that point, we are disobedient and faithless. So um, we should hate sin because it is doing the opposite or it accomplishes the opposite of what God uh, wants us to do. Secondly, or actually thirdly, if, you, if we count that we should hate sin because God says we should. Uh, so thirdly, we should hate sin because sin is the source of evil. Um, it's a source of corruption, and it is also the source of death. So it's all the things in this world that are difficult, horrible, and make life hard. Make life on this earth hard. Make life a struggle. That's what sin does. It makes life a struggle. So sin is the source of all these things that are bad. Um, it is it, sin has caused a curse on creation. And because of that curse, we suffer. And we only suffer because of sin. Everything that you're going through now, all the trouble that you have in your life, um, it is due to sin. And that is a good reason for us to hate sin. And then lastly, we should hate sin because all of creation must be saved from it. Uh, we should hate sin because of what, what God had to do in order to save us from sin. We are the ones uh, who put Christ on the cross, essentially. Yes, Christ followed the commandment of God, followed the will of his Father, went to the cross and died for us, but we are the reasons why Christ had to die. Um, so uh, just for what what Christ had to do, uh, we should hate sin. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So not only should we hate sin because of, of the curse that it brings upon creation, but we should hate sin because of what our Savior had to do in order to save us. And, and, we, and we were responsible for that. So that kind of gives us a, a quick uh, definition of sin, if you will. And it also helps us to think of, of why we should hate sin. And uh, sin is not our friend. Sin does not help us at all. 
it feels that way. It feels like it does, and it feels like it's our closest friend at time, but it, he's a deceiver. Uh, sin is from the devil. Um, sin is from the father of lies. And just like its father, uh, sin deceives us and makes us think that it is fun. It makes us think that it is beneficial. It is edifying, and there's nothing wrong with it. And all that is a lie. All that is a lie from the enemy, and we should hate sin because it is destructive. Um, so when we talk about repentance, we need to talk about the uh, area or the phase where we come to hate sin. Now, we've been talking about repentance for several weeks now in, in, our, in this Bible study series, at least. And um, now we've, cut, we've gotten to the point where we can talk about our hatred for sin as an act of repentance. Uh, see, the truth is, is that before we can fully repent of our sin, then we must truly hate our sin. So, I, I, and I use, I use my words um, very carefully because I, I, I want us to understand. And um, the two words that I use very carefully are fully and truly. Before we fully repent, we have to truly hate. And uh, that's very important because uh, there are people who think they have repented of a sin, but yet they still, they still love it. And uh, there is no struggle with that sin. They are still given into that sin. And just because they're able to stay away from it for a little while, uh, people count that as repentance. And unfortunately, that is not true repentance. Also, what we have to recognize is that um, hating the consequence is not repentance. And we've touched on that before, uh, that we actually, we have to hate the sin. Uh, why? Because we have sinned against God. Um, the fact that we have sinned against God causes all kind of different things in us, uh, sorrow for sin. And uh, the other thing is also a hatred uh, of it because with it, we disobey God. And that's the last thing that we, anybody, uh, should want to do is disobey uh, our Heavenly Father. So it's not just, the, uh, not just the dislike or the hatred of the consequences of sin, uh, but we need to hate the act itself. And that's where it gets pretty tough. Uh, and listen here to the Apostle Paul as he describes the relationship between the hatred of sin and the act of committing sin. Uh, this is where we can turn to Romans chapter 7, and I want to read uh, for you verses 14 through 25. So that's Romans 7, verses 14 through 25. This is some really good stuff from Paul. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. Now I can just stop there and and we can relate to what Paul is saying here, right? There is a struggle. There is a struggle to do the right thing. And that's exactly what Paul is indicating here in verse 15, where he says, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want. Okay? But I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I could have a room full of people and I would ask, how many of you have felt that way? I guarantee all hands would go up. All hands would go up. Um, if I'm speaking to a room of Christians and I say, have Paul, Paul's words, has his, his feelings here, have you ever thought that? Have you ever been through that? And yeah, I can guarantee all hands would go up. So um, he gets our attention here because we can all relate to this. Uh, verse 16 says, now, if I do, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law, it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. So what Paul is saying to us here and revealing to us, actually, is that Outside of Christ, there is no good in us. Outside of Christ, we only have sin. 
And it's indwelling sin. It's been with us from the very beginning. And he's acknowledging that outside of Christ, there is no, uh, there is no power to please God. And there is no capability to do that either. Um, so he says that in verse 18. And he says, For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Verse 19. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Now, Paul's not um, giving us an out of uh, get out of jail free card, and he is not taken us off the hook, so to speak. Um, we are completely responsible for our sin, but Paul is just recognizing the source of our disobedience. The source of our disobedience is a sinful heart. It is a heart of stone. And even after God changes our hearts to a heart of flesh, there's still indwelling sin that we have to deal with. And so Paul is actually saying in these verses that... Um, there is a lot of good that he wants to do. In fact, in his, in his spirit, he only wants to please God. But in his flesh, he wants to please himself. So there is this ongoing battle. And there are times that in verse, where he says it in verse 19, I'll just read it because he says it perfectly, actually, actually. He says, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Uh, that, 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 that's the struggle there. Um, even though we hate sin, we still struggle with it. So it is possible. Well, before I get ahead, let me continue to read. Verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. He says, verse 22. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. You see, that's the result of a heart change. He actually delights in God's law. He delights in pleasing God. Even though he struggles with sin, he loves God and he loves to do what God commands him to do. Verse 23, but I see in my members another law waging war against the mind, the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Now verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of from this body of death? Verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Now, I bring that passage to you just to help you to think through this and help you to see how it all works in a practical sense. Even though this verse is focused on the spiritual life, there is a there is a practical struggle that we all go through. The fact that um, we have a hatred for sin and yet we struggle with it. Uh, sometimes there is a disconnect with that. Uh, there are people who think that since they struggle with sin, that means they love it. That is not true. To love it is not to struggle with it at all. To love that sin is to just uh, let it take over you and to be a servant to it. The Christian does not do that. The Christian hates his sin and he is in battle, in conflict. He is uh, he, he, is, he is fighting against that sin. So the truth is that we can actually hate the sin that we keep on doing. And this is especially true for those, those sins who have, or that have deeply rooted themselves into our hearts. Um, just a couple, maybe a year ago or so, a um, year and a half ago, I was working out um, there at, at my house, clearing out trees, uh, small oak trees and, and small brush. And as I was clearing these trees out, I was trying to take everything out. I was trying to take the tree, cut down the tree. There was a stump left trying to take out the stumps. And it was really hard work. It was 
just physical, physically hard work. And the reason why it was so hard was because when you got to the stump and you tried to pull uh, the stump out, uh, mechanically, manually, it didn't matter. It was difficult. Why? Because those roots ran deep. And I really got a sense of that, of that phrase, and, and I've used it before, but I really got an understanding of it. And that is the way sin is in our hearts. Uh, before we are a new creation, before God changes our hearts, we are given over to sin. And there are some sins that we like to, that, that like to hold on to us, and we, we want to let them go, but they are rooted in our hearts. And it's very hard work to get rid of them. And, and, and that is the picture that I get whenever I'm reading uh, Romans 7 and Paul is sharing with us the struggle there is with hating sin and, and doing away with it. Um, so anyway, I hope that's, that's a helpful illustration. Like all illustrations, I think they fall a little short, uh, but I hope that's helpful at least to give you a better understanding. Now, when we talk about sins that have rooted deeply into our hearts, this points to the fact of how wretched we are. And that's exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter 7. He says, what, what a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this body of death? And uh, he answers his own question. He says, Jesus Christ, my Lord. That is our only hope. That is the only answer to the problem that we have with sin. And that is the only way that we can hate sin is to cling on to Christ. And that is the beautiful, that is the beautiful thing and that is the beautiful truth. You see, we are so wretched and our sin shows us that. But not only that we are wretched, it shows us how much we need the atoning sacrifice of Christ and how much we need the power of the Spirit to live in order to please God. So um, every day we just need to cling on to Christ and depend on the Spirit's leading. And, and that's what's important. We can hate the sin that we struggle with, but listen, we never stop fighting against it. We never stop fighting against it. Just because you do it doesn't mean you love it. I'm, I'm speaking to my, my, my Christian brothers and sisters here. Continue to fight that sin. Um, because that's what repentance is. Repentance is a man's struggle to kill the sin that plagues him. You hate the sin and you are, you are at war with it. You are in a fight with it. And it is a close combat type of fight. It's brutal. It's exhausting. Um, it, it never ends. But listen, we must keep fighting sin. We must keep hating sin. We must hate it because it is against what God wills for our lives. It is against what God has obeyed us to do. Um, we must continue to fight it, and we must continue to hate it. Uh, this is a fight that we are called to fight. It is the good fight of the faith, as Paul says in 2 Timothy. Now, this is a lifelong battle. This is not going to be over with um, tomorrow, next week. In fact, it's not over with until we're in glory, until God calls us up, uh, and until we are resting with him. This is a lifelong battle for the Christian. But listen, he has told us in his word that we will have victory. We will have the victory because we are in Christ. And it is in Christ uh, that we are victorious. And he is the only reason why. Romans 8, 37 says, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And obviously him is Jesus Christ. So, what, what's, what, are, what are some things that you can focus on when it comes to a practical apl application of hating sin and staying away from it? Well, I think Romans 8 really helps us uh, to uh, see what it is to live, live a life that pleases God. In essence, it is living a life in the Spirit. And Romans 8 verses 1 through 17 really help us with that, and I want to read that for you. It says, 
There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Verse 3, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So this is the victory that I'm talking about. Paul's mentioning uh, we have a we have a savior. Jesus Christ came and dealt with sin in a way that we could not. Um, sin held us captive. It made us do what we did not want to do all the time. And now we have a savior who saved us from the bondage of sin. And now we can we can actually choose to live according to the flesh or live according to the spirit to please only ourselves or to primarily please God. And he continues in verse four. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Now, this is where this is where I am talking about as far as us, the difference between us hating sin and us loving sin. If we are loving sin, then our minds are just sinful. And and it doesn't matter if we've made a public proclamation that we uh, that we follow Christ or that or if we say we are Christians, if we say we are Christians, and all we are focused on is the flesh and pleasing ourselves, and we are not worried about um, obeying God, then are we truly Christians? If, if our minds are set on the flesh, then our, our whole lives will bear that type of fruit. It will bear bad fruit. So a mind that is set on the flesh does the things of the flesh. That is a good indication of someone who does not hate sin, but rather who loves sin. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Verse 5 is critical in understanding the difference between hate, hating sin and loving sin. Um, it ends with, with what we should be doing as Christians. Again, we may struggle against sin, but the whole while, we are struggling against it. We are fighting it. Why? Because we have our minds set on the Spirit. And we want to please God through living through the Spirit. By, by living through the Spirit. Verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. See, it just those people who love sin, they're just completely disobedient to sin. Uh, and, it, and it finishes off, verse 7 finishes off, and it says, Indeed, it cannot. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, you... I'm speaking to the Christian here. Actually, Paul is speaking to us. Actually, God is speaking to us, you. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put the death, 
you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. To me, uh, Romans 8, verses 1 through 17, the passage that I just read to you, is extremely helpful in learning how to uh, live a life that pleases God, how to live a life of repentance. And when you add verse, uh, chapter, Romans chapter 7 to Romans chapter 8, uh, really teaches you on what it means to hate sin and to love God. And if you want to continue reading Romans 8, it is, it is beautiful because the very next ver uh, section, starting with verse 18, talks about the future glory that we have uh, with Christ as heirs. Um, so anyway, I, I, I wanted to give you that passage to show you that God's word really instructs us on what we should do with sin, how we should feel about it, and how we should interact with it. So the result of living life in the spirit is that you will put to death, you will put to death the deeds of the body and you will have life. You will live. So Christian, God, I, I want you to really think about this. Um, God has called you. Or let me start off with this, actually. God has created in you a new heart. He has when he when he saved you. He has create, created in you a new heart. And with this new heart, uh, he has completely changed you. You are no longer the person you were. You are a new creation, the Bible says. And with this new heart, you are to love what he loves and you are to hate what he hates. In fact, that happens to us. It's not like something that we have to. We don't have to go and like we have to turn on the lights uh, when we go into a room. We don't have to turn on our heart to love what God loves and to hate what he hates. This is the work of the spirit in us. When, when, we, are, when we are changed, when we are regenerated, uh, God, and, give, and when he gives us a new heart, that heart of flesh, we love what he loves and we hate what he hates. So uh, that is a wonderful truth that the word of God tells us. So um, along with that, we know that he hates sin, and so should we. So we should pray to the Lord that he not only uh, help us with the hatred of sin, but also that he will, he will help us to uh, put sin to death in us uh, so that he will help us to kill sin. Because that's what we need to do. Uh, and Jesus is our weapon. Um, the Bible is our sword. Jesus is our secret weapon. And as we know, uh, no one can stand against Christ. Uh, no sin can stand against him. That's why Mark 8, 34, we are challenged by our Lord. He tells us, deny yourselves. Pick up your cross and follow me. There is, there is nothing passive about that. Uh, to deny ourselves is to, is to fight sin. It's to hate it and fight against it. And uh, Christians, we need to really deny ourselves. So we come to the conclusion of this Bible study. And I just want to give you some things to think about um, so in, a, in a practical way. Uh, first of all, remember that the goal of your hatred for sin is to be more like Christ. I, I don't want us to do this in a sense that pride builds up in us and we uh, we look at somebody else and we are judging them because either we are better than them or maybe we're hard on ourselves and we're not as good as somebody else. Um, that's not the goal of, of, of our hatred for sin. I, I've already told you why we should hate sin. Um, and, and ultimately we should hate sin because we want to be more like Christ. Uh, Christ uh, of course, hated sin 
he hated it so much that he that he himself freed us from it. Um, so we need to be more like Christ. Um, it, it reminds me of what John the Baptist said in John chapter three, verse thirty, when uh, he sees Christ and he says, "He speaking of Christ, he must increase, but I must decrease." Now. I will admit, I mean, when, when we see that passage, just to be true to that passage and to know its context, uh, when John said that, he was speaking about Jesus' earthly ministry and how Jesus' ministry would be um, going upward and, and, and he, would, he would gain a, a bigger following. Um, it needed to be uh, promoted and set on a higher priority. Um, that it would be successful. That's what he was saying about Jesus's ministry. And then he was also saying about his ministry that it will become smaller and smaller and smaller until it would be gone. So I, I want to be true to the context of that passage. Um, but I also, I also want to um, apply that passage to the spiritual things of life and how wonderful of a passage it is for us to remember that in our sanctification, that is the goal. The goal is for Christ and his spirit to uh, increase in us in good works and for our flesh to decrease in us. Uh, that, is, that is the goal of our sanctification. And that's what we should want. We should want to be more like Christ. So uh, John 3.30 is a great reminder for us. And we should remember that in all things. Um, from a spiritual aspect, you know, um, that what I just said is, is completely, completely true. So through the good, the bad and ugliness of life, uh, we need to recognize the fact that the Lord is sanctifying us and um, the work that he has started in us. Well, he's going to carry it to completion. So your daily goal is 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 for your desires, um, the desires of your flesh to decrease and the desires of the spirit to increase in you. And that is what we should uh, be hoping for, be praying for, be focusing on. And we do all this uh, solely for the um, honor and glory of God. Uh, we do this out of an act of worship and uh, we depend on God for uh, him working through us in order to hate sin the way we need to hate sin so that we can truly repent. So we are in essence, we are to grow into the image of Christ. And we cannot do that if we love the sin that, we, that, that, that is in our lives. Um, we must hate what God hates, and we must love what he loves. So anyway, I hope this was helpful for you, um, and I hope that this was edifying to your spirit. And I, I hope that it, it helps you in your fight against sin and to help you to know a little bit more about what repentance is and what you should do in repentance. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you. Bye bye.